that uh, um, really report and have a conversation with us. Mr. Power, you've been here uh, the last two days, so you know what we're up to. Uh, you know, we've been, for anyone who wasn't in the room, basically, uh, I think we've recapitulated a miniature the F-62 proceedings so in a way, and had a lot of conversations. Um, I would love to hear your report and um, and then uh, have some discussion uh, to follow. Uh, looking forward to how we might construct a committee bill that takes advantage of what we what you're sharing with us and what we learned this week. So thanks again for coming over. And the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Senator Bray. And for the record, I'm Margaret Cheney. I'm one of the three commissioners on the Public Utility Commission. And with me today is Policy Director Tom Nauer, and uh, he was the lead author of the report, and he'll be chiming in um, whenever uh, he wants to add or correct what I'm saying. So, Act 62, which he passed, um, was signed into law in June uh, last year, June 2019. Among other questions, it asked the PUC to consider whether the state could create an all-fuels energy efficiency program with coordinated funding and implementation for all regulated and unregulated fuels. As a reminder, we have had a statewide, comprehensive, fully regulated approach to electric and now natural gas efficiency, which is funded by an efficiency charge on everyone's bills. Unre unregulated fuels fuel oil, propane, diesel, and gasoline have no such comprehensive program or uniform or adequate source of funding. Of course, in considering whether to create such a program, funding is an essential element. Act 62 asked for two reports, one in six months and the final report in January of 2021, next year. What we delivered to your committee on Wednesday is the approximately 60-page preliminary report, the result of an investigation that included a series of written filings and workshops with participants from state agencies, electric, natural gas, and efficiency utilities, building professionals, consulting groups, industry groups, and citizens. The investigation is ongoing and will conclude with the final report due a year from now. The first report lays out Vermont's existing laws, policies, and programs for all fuels and their multiple funding sources. Understanding the multiple uncoordinated spotty programs, and importantly, the various existing spotty funding that goes with each program is a necessary starting point for designing a meaningful, coordinated, statewide approach for all fuels. What is not in the preliminary report is the answers to these questions. This will require more time for a much deeper dive. For example, if the focus switches to prioritization of greenhouse gas reductions in all fuels over efficiency savings in regulated fuels, how would achievement be measured? How would spending be prioritized? What would be the impact on bills? What are other funding options? What if there are no other funding options? The design of the program will be affected dramatically by the amount of funding and where it comes from. <coughs> Again, this report is due a year from now. So to review what we have in place today, first, at the highest level, our energy policy is based on ensuring, and this is in statute, Vermont's ability to meet its energy needs in a way that's adequate, reliable, sustainable, and affordable, and encourages economic vitality, the efficient use of resources, cost-effective demand-side management, and protection of the environment. The Comprehensive Energy Plan, the second bullet, was um, the plan of 2016, includes a, a number of broad goals, but also specific recommendations to reduce energy con consumption per capita by 15% by 2025 and more than a third by 2050. 
It proposes meeting 25% of the need for renewables by 2025, 40% from renewables by 2035, and 90% by 2050. Remember, these percentages apply to all energy, not just electric. It suggests renewable end uses of 10% for transportation, 30% buildings, and 67% electric. Then, number three in statute, we have targets pegged to 1990 baseline levels to reduce greenhouse gases by 50% by 2018, two years ago, and 75% by 2050. In the res, we have specific requirements for electric utilities, both in the electric sector and in carbon reduction. We have long established regulated programs for our electric and now our natural gas utilities, our electric energy efficiency program, that are held to performance standards and have a dedicated funding stream. Next to last, Section 209E tagged funding for weatherization from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and the Forward Capacity Market and requires the program to make quote unquote continuous progress toward attaining our building efficiency goals. And finally, the goal for weatherization is in Title 10 to improve the energy fitness of 80,000 homes by 2020. So it's a real patchwork. But then there are regional and global efforts, too. We fit within that context. Unlike the Trump administration, Vermont has signed on to the 2016 Paris Climate Agreement through the US Climate Alliance, which includes 25 states. Vermont is also engaged in the New England Governors and Eastern Canadian Premier's Climate Change Action Plan, and of course, Reggie. At the federal level, we still have the Environmental Protection Agency's Affordable Clean Energy Rule and the Department of Energy's Appliance and Equipment Standards. Tom, don't forget to chime in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here, broadly, is where we are today. You can read it for yourselves. If you can see that far, you can see it. Okay. Um, the figure for electricity reflects our status as of 2016, which came from a 2017 report issued by the Department of Public Service. They just issued a report yesterday? Uh, Wednesday. Wednesday, and? That's their annual energy report under Section 202B. And so uh, it may be necessary to update some of these figures that we didn't have access to when we issued our report. But we understand the electricity percentage is more or less the same. Relative to specific goals and requirements, our success varies. All three tiers on our are on track for the res. Uh, we have continued success in the traditional energy efficiency world, electric energy efficiency, I should say. Um, but as you can see, we're falling really far behind in our greenhouse gas reductions. The most recent report from the Agency of Natural Resources shows our greenhouse gases to have decreased 4% from 2015, but we are still 13% higher than we were 30 years ago, and this is solely due to emissions from our cars, trucks, and fossil fuel heating systems. I, I, uh I have an observation. Uh, after Commissioner Cheney put these slides together, uh, I was reviewing the, the slide deck. And you, you can note the, the first two bullets, uh, the first regarding the RES program, and the second is uh, our, our traditional efficiency programs. Uh, the first two bullets where Vermont can claim some great success, uh, those reflect sectors of the Vermont economy where lawmakers have identified the policy and the funding. Uh, they've uh, put the PUC and the Department of Public Service uh, in charge of put, uh, providing the regulatory oversight and the uh, lawmakers have tasked regulated entities with stepping up and being accountable. And I, my observation is the second can't be said about the, the second two bullets uh, where uh, we, we don't yet have funding identified. 
So that's the difficult job that you guys have. It's easy. It's the easiest part of all But But if, if and when you are able to identify funding sources for these sectors of the Vermont economy, I'm confident that the Vermont community can step up and, and uh, form the, the types of oversight and, and uh, accountability that would be necessary to achieve this. And I think one example of what uh, Mr. Nauer was saying is that in weatherization, uh, we did have a, a, a goal that was in place for a number of years and um, for 50,000 homes short for the reasons that he mentioned. And to emphasize it again in a different way, um, why are we falling backwards? Most of them have to do with money and scarcity of trained workers in the weatherization area, too. We hear repeatedly that is a problem as well. But it could be partially tied to the fact that there is no security about what the funding level it is. You can hire more workers if there's not a program that is robustly funded. Right. I think um, we talked with um, Capstone last year when we were working on Act 62. They were asking us not to do again what had happened before, where there was a surge of funding. I don't know if it was our money that flowed into Vermont. Yes, it um, was. So there was hiring at that time to yes. pick up the pace, and then that was a, it was one-time money, not ongoing funds, and then you know, and the painful experience of hiring on training people and then having to reduce staff. That, that's a consistent message that we've heard in the investigation, both from Capstone and from the uh, Building Performance Professionals Association. The, the contractors are hesitant to staff up or to invest in equipment for weatherization without a dedicated, stable, long-term commitment to, to funding sources. And, and with respect to the, the third bill, I just wanted to, to expand on that a little bit. Um, we know that we have the weatherization assistance programs for lower income Vermonters. Um, those, those programs will basically provide 100% of the funding necessary for, for the weatherization work. And, and the efficiency utilities get involved as well. You know, if you need a new appliance, you know, the, the, they often cover 100% of the cost. Um, higher income level Vermonters who have good credit scores, they have access to financing so that uh, when they know that they need to do some weather relation work, they, they can get financing. There's there's the middle part of, of Vermont demographics that you know financing in addition to funding is, is a real question mark. And so this will look perhaps more accurately should have said for all but the very highest income levels, which um, presumably in which area many people might take cash anyway. So um, through, the, through the renewable energy standard, um, our electric distribution utilities have a mandate, not a goal, to reduce fossil fuel consumption through their tier three requirements. They are meeting these requirements through a wide menu of options depending on the utility. For example, line extensions to replace fossil fuel generators with electricity, snow making compression, heat pumps, electric vehicle incentives, and so on. Vermonters also spend more of their energy budget on the worst greenhouse gas emitters. First, on filling their cars and trucks, which is the highest greenhouse gas sector. Second, on staying warm, which is the second highest emitter of greenhouse gases, and least on their electric bills. And we're having the least success <coughs> in the sectors that emit, that emit the most greenhouse gases and cost Vermonters the most money. So, where is the current funding <coughs> in our various programs coming from, such as they are? Uh, first, our established efficiency programs are funded by a monthly charge on each ratepayer's bill relative to their usage. We have programs for large energy users from global foundries and 
down to slightly smaller industrial and commercial customers um, that are self-funded and have performance standards. And utilities use ratepayer funds to meet their res requirements. I'm sorry, I'm confused. You told us use the, the rate payer financing, but you yeah, said that words, you said that the first one was self-funded. Yes. Would you like this? well for for example, with SMEEP, which is the um, uh, program for global foundries, it was first started for IBM uh, in lieu of paying their customer. I mean their electric efficiency charge. So they're not self-funded. They use the money that. Not in that case. However, in the case of these some of these other programs. Um, can you explain how that works? It's a little more complicated for those. I, right, so yeah, so for the SMEEP program, rather than paying into, into the statewide system, um, ent entities that qualify, uh, I think it's, it's Global Foundries and now OMIA was, was admitted to the program a year or so ago, uh, they can enter the program, not pay the efficiency charge, as long as they dedicate to spending a, a minimum amount over a three-year period. The other two programs, the Energy Savings Account Program and the Customer Credit Programs, uh, those customers in those programs do pay into the statewide efficiency fund, but they, they kind of manage it more, more than you and I do when we pay into the efficiency fund. They, they get a, a, de a dedicated percentage back and they work with the efficiency utility. I, forgive me, Mr. Chair, but when you say that they're self-funded, they're, they're not, they get a tax break over here and they spend their money differently. So it's... That may be um, probably a, a result of trying to be too efficient in the, in the slide. <laughs> when, when the public hears that they're self-funded, they think they're doing it themselves. Right. So, so that, thank you. I, that terminology, I apologize for the okay. That terminology is not in the report. Is is trying to be efficiently express the idea in the slide. I ask a quick question on the SMEEP funding level. Is it comparable to the, uh, the although it's, they're managing themselves? Is it comparable? Is the dollars spent comparable to if they paid in the energy efficiency change? I haven't done that analysis. My my. Suspicion is that when the law was passed about a decade ago, probably it was expected to be about the same. Um, but I, I haven't done that analysis uh, for today. Okay. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen it for a while, but I believe there's a requirement in that law that says they have to meet a certain standard of reinvestment. That's correct. They have to uh, spend a minimum amount per year for global founders, I think it's a million dollars per year. Mm -hmm. but, you know, three million over a three-year period, and for only I think it's less. Like, going on memory, I think it's half a million per year. And, and Mr. Mr. Chair, there's, we're trying to understand the facts so you can give us a recommendation in the future. SMEEP, um, we have a mandate today in law to reduce fossil fuels and um, enjoy the least cost way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The SMEEP program allows those people who are using money not going to, to the ETC fund to, in, to spend it on fossil fuels and not on electric savings. That's one of the provisions in there. So that is contrary to, um, and the legislature passed it, but contrary to the mandate that, that previously existed. Notwithstanding the mandate, they're able to do this. It's different, yes. They, they are, I think, rather than self-funded, the better word would be self-administered. Mm -hmm. And they're and allowed to use it, and we not withstood the mandate about carbon fuels to allow them to use it for things not reducing carbon fuels, and perhaps increasing the use of carbon fuels. I, I'd say uh, certainly for participants in this SMEEP, as well as the new customer credit pilot, uh, you're allowed to use that money on a wider variety of projects than uh, for programs. This is what I just said, and you just said it differently. Okay, so the answer is yes. We're in agreement. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so I, I will go on. I just started with some of the programs and their funding. Um, there's more. Uh, low income weatherization gets money from the weatherization, weather assistance program. Um, 
through a gross receipts tax on all fuels with intersections with the Department of Energy and federal life systems. <coughs> Second, um, there is limited <coughs> non-low-income weatherization provided by Efficiency Vermont with a dedicated from fund from REGI and forward capacity market revenue. But this source is volatile. At this week's demand resources plan presentation, Efficiency Vermont forecast that the state will be receiving $3. million less in Reggie and FCM revenue for these programs. We have no control over that. Sure. And that's for what time period, please? Excuse me? The, the forecast of down $3 million is for? $3.8 million for 20. For, for the next three year uh, mm -hmm. performance period, 21 through 23. Thank you. Senator McCown. You didn't include in the, I, there's a substantial amount of low income weatherization that takes place on fossil fuels um, collected through the energy efficiency tax on natural gas. Is that true? That is correct. So but that wasn't mentioned in one of the funding sources in, well, in low income weatherization. You mentioned several, but not the, the carbon tax on the natural gas. Well, that's meant to be covered in the first bullet on the previous slide. Um, Vermont Gas is a regulated utility, and they rec were recently, in the last few years, appointed to be an efficiency utility as well. And so, um, in that first bullet there, they also levy a customer usage charge and have uh, commission-approved budgets and performance. And then customer uses charges on fossil fuels? Yes, on Thank natural you. gas. Yeah, okay. I, yes. I didn't hear that distinctly in, in your presentation. Okay. Thank you. There it is in the first bullet. That, that, is a, that is a regulated fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the distinctions we're making between regulated fossil fuels and electricity, and which have programs that are funded, and unregulated fuels. So we're, um, Finally, um, we also have some variable funding for electric vehicle incentives through utilities as part of their tier three activity, through the Volkswagen Settlement Fund, and through federal tax credits. And here I'll put in a plug for a very comprehensive report we issued to the legislature last June, full of specific recommendations on how to grow electric vehicle use and charging infrastructure in the state, not all of which come with a price tag. Besides the recommendations in that report, we also include a recommendation in today's report, and this week's report, I should say. That is for the legislature to approve the use of efficiency charge money collected from <coughs> charging EVs for strategies aimed at upstream transformation and um, um, upstream market barriers. Like, for example, promoting awareness of electric vehicles, working with manufacturers, creating dealer networks, training sales teams, the strategic placement of electric uh, charging in infrastructure, and other supply chain activities. The goal would be to increase the availability of electric vehicles and improve the capability of the workforce to sell them now, electric efficiency utilities are currently not authorized to participate directly in supporting the electrification of the transportation sector. So we support a limited application of the electric efficiency charge to fill this need. It could be done with the statutory change suggested here. Um, and uh, if I'm remembering from uh, Efficiency Vermont's testimony earlier this week, currently that of uh, would generate something in the order of $110,000, $120,000 a year. Is that not right? That was the, the, the monies you're uh, identifying here? That's correct. Yeah. yeah, we internally did a back of the envelope calculation. We, we came up with the exact same figure that Efficiency Vermont provided us in one of our workshops. And as, as you're considering um, this recommendation, I would advise the committee to um, also keep, keep tabs on what the Senate Transportation Committee may or may not be doing. Um, 
<coughs> with respect to electric vehicles and um, efficiency charges. I, I know that the, the Public Utility Commission was requested last year to do a follow-up study to the electric vehicle report that Commissioner Cheney just discussed. And that request from lawmakers was, uh, one of the questions asked was whether there ought to be a transportation efficiency charge that would be the same level as, but in lieu of the electric efficiency charge. And, and my understanding is the commission's report recommended not to do that, not to have a transportation efficiency charge. And um, I just, I, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make sense to me to, to go down both roads, uh, both repurpose electric efficiency funds as we're suggesting you consider, and uh, dedicate that same pool of money to the transportation efficiency fee. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't be feasible. Um, and yeah. the report that he just mentioned was submitted to the transportation committees in December last month. That was at that was their your request. Supplemental report. Excuse me? That was your supplemental report. Supplemental report. report. So there are two reports. The one I mentioned that we issued in June is full of general recommendations, and the other is specific to, um, to fees. Um, so thanks for that heads up. And um, I mean, I think if there was a word that was used more often than any other word this week in our discussions, it was uh, collaboration and, uh, well, collaboration would be that word. So it would, it would be helpful to not have uh, competing disjointed things moving forward. Well, if I could <laughs> add a word to your um, list, it would be coordination. Yeah. So, in, in compiling all the different programs and funding sources that currently exist in the all-fuels landscape, we came to some general conclusions. First, our current efficiency programs are well-coordinated, there's the coordination, are well-coordinated and held to strong performance standards. They are successful. Still, they engage only a portion of Vermont's economy. Second. Efficiency programs for all other fuels are uncoordinated, inconsistent, and without performance standards. They are severely underfunded relative to our need to achieve our greenhouse gas reduction goals. Just as in programs, the same disparities exist for funding. Existing law provides a reliable, fair, funding stream for electric and natural gas efficiency, but funding for all other fuels is severely limited relative to what the state aspires to achieve. According to prior studies, the funding gap amounts to 30 to $60 million per year, but we need to examine this further for our final report. The 30 to $60 million, um, is that from the I am wondering if you know what report that cuts out of. I've seen more than one figure. But some of it was like the Total Energy, uh, the Thermal Energy Task Force, but that's. The, the seven Task years Force ago. Um, uh, mentioned a range of 30 to $40 million. Okay. But there have been a number of studies done, and so here the range. Right, so to add to that, I'd say. The low end of, of this range reflects what the task force reported, the Thermal Efficiency Task Force, uh, and their work was really focused on the weatherization goals. And the upper end of this reflects um, the regulatory assistance uh, projects report to lawmakers last uh, February when they were looking at more uh, holistic, uh, looking at fossil fuel and greenhouse gas reductions, and that's looking at both transportation, electrification, uh, as well as thermal uh, approaches. And in terms of that, uh, sort of, I know we're not here to really drill down into funding, but in terms of sort of the rough math for it, is that to uh, put us on track to meet a particular target or all targets? What that spending uh, pace is? Correct. That's, that's to put us on a, on a path towards, towards achieving the, the statutory goals. And it would be annually, 
with, the, with right. considering where we need to end up. Right. 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 But again, we need to do that analysis. Sure. Yeah, we we tried to be very clear in the report that these are not you know commission generated numbers. The, these are you know we we've got existing resources and reports that have uh, been provided to lawmakers. And in fact, I asked the question of participants in in our case. You know, is the task force report number is that a reasonable proxy for today? I think that that report was issued in. 2013 or 14, and you know we're, we're six, seven years down the road, and people said, "Yeah, it's a reasonable proxy to begin the conversation." Senator McDonald, um, I sense that your presentation today is moving from what you've learned to to, to where we might go, yeah. and I, I wonder, ask, and I quibbled over a couple places in your report where I think you didn't state as boldly, uh, politically sensitive. Things that you've learned, and I don't understand why. But we may yet do so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, patience. In the in doing this report, and you folks know more about the details and the nuts and bolts. What did you find that came to the members, the people <clears throat> doing the report, that you know surprised them or taught taught you something that you didn't know when you started the report? What did you learn that you didn't sort of already know? Well, there is one slide further on that it get, it, that is one thing that, I, that was not only surprising but also important to what we planned going forward. I'm thinking of the different measures and return on the Yes, yeah. so, I think that's... So, what, we'll, what was that? It's, it'll be in a future slide. It's oh, about... Okay. okay I'll, and I'll, I'll find it when we get to it. Okay. okay. You, that's one thing. Thank thing. You. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. One theme that I don't think was surprising, but that I've already alluded to, that strikes us over and over, is that if we are going to achieve our goals, we need funding for the um, heating and transportation sector problem. So, um, I'll keep going. Yes, please. Yes. Um, so, it, weatherization, turning just to weatherization, we emphasize the funding point. And our next report will not just analyze the amount needed, but will aim to make specific recommendations for where the money could or should come from. One example that has already been floated appears here and on the next slide. Uh, this comes from the Department of Public Services Thermal Efficiency Task Force report, which we've already mentioned that that, that was at, issued in 2013. It suggested a fossil fuel excise tax or a thermal systems benefits charge as equitable and transparent. It estimated what would be needed to raise 10, 20, or 30 million dollars. They did not include natural gas in the analysis because Vermont Gas at that point had not been appointed a efficiency utility and was not levying an efficiency charge on ratepayers at that point. So their analysis included a separate tax on natural gas. Again, we have not yet analyzed the amount of funding that would be needed to meet our goals. The same Thermal Efficiency Task Force report estimated that we would need about 30 to 40 million per year, but um, in contrast or in a different avenue, uh, representatives from the Regulatory Assistance Project recommended that fossil fuels should contribute to efficiency at a level closer to what is contributed by electricity and natural gas. And this chart shows how much would be raised by different levels of tax on liquid fuels. Again, it includes natural gas, and that's a little outdated given that they have a program now. I think it's also, this is based on fuel usage at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and as we all know, fuel usage changes all the time. And uh, you know, some people who use used to be burning fuel or propane, you know, now have access to natural gas in Addison County. And people may have more efficient boilers or, or furnaces, and so their consumption has already gone down. And so this reflects a snapshot in time, and uh, it, it would be worthwhile updating this. Yes, and this is not meant as a recommendation, it is just meant as, as Tom said, a snapshot and uh, an example of some of the analysis that's already been performed, and we need to do our own version of the same. 
Um, another example, um, her raising, or an idea of her raising revenue comes from a February 2019 report by the Regulatory Assistance Project. Before I go on, I should say that the source I put on this slide is inaccurate, and I will be providing a um, new slide to um, the committee uh, and remember what the source actually was. Right. Yeah, this was also discussed in the task force report. Okay. So this idea was to impose an efficiency obligation on all suppliers of unre unregulated fuels because uh, they do not currently pay an efficiency fee. In common parlance, what, what's that recommendation? That would be, in other words, for example, for the electricity and the natural gas that ratepayers use, they pay an efficiency charge based on their usage. Uh, that is, that, that model um, is another way, rather than a simple excise tax, it would be an efficiency charge. How would it differ, Tom? Well, so, so the way that I have understood this idea and been thinking about this idea is not mandate that you pony up and uh, contribute to, to a central fund. Instead, um, if you're a, someone involved in the unregulated fuel sector, uh, you could say you have an obligation to uh, come up with two, three percent efficiency per year. You can do that by contracting with, with someone. You can do that by providing the services on your own. Or if those options aren't appealing to you, you could pay into a central fund. You, you could, uh, and that so, the administrator of that central fund would, would implement the services for you. You just mentioned both a, a several mechanisms for bureaucracy systems to provide the money. You also mentioned that percentage figure. What was the? Uh, just for example, you know, say you have to come up with two percent efficiency per year. And since you, and what what's the energy efficiency charge percentage right now for electricity? Well, uh, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of your head. We we don't do it as a percentage basis. It, it's a fixed charge. You know, a, a, a set. Uh, you know, Fractions, fractions of cents uh, per kilowatt hour. And, and so, you know, <laughs> approximately 5%. You guys can't tell us roughly what the percentage is. Yeah, approximately 5%. Who else? Approximately 5% of your bill is a, is, a, is a good ballpark figure. You concur with that? Yes. Yeah. But it's not done as a percentage calculation, but that's what it works out to. Um, this is more along okay. well, the, a model of performance standards, so that they, people who are selling fuel X percent. need to address efficiency work. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take that as an information request, and we can send you yeah. exact figures. Yes. Back um, to the overarching goal where do we need to be? Depending on whether we're taking uh, state goals into account or international goals, the numbers are high. But there are incremental concrete ways to meet them. In February last year, RAP issued uh, to the legislature its report called Economic Benefits and Energy Savings Through Low-Cost Carbon Management. The report estimated the greenhouse gas reductions that would result from specific investments in the thermal and transportation sectors. I've taken the top four returns on investment that were in their report. In other words, dollars spent per greenhouse gas reduction achieved but the report goes into more detail and provides other investment calculations, such as for wood pellet boilers for schools and heavy-duty electric vehicles. We have not independently assessed these results. However, if you took these four, these four measures and compared them to the numbers on the previous slide, in terms of million metric tons, and here we have um, dollars spent in um, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, achieved, um, you can see that the goals are achievable with the right strategy and the required investment. 
a co comprehensive approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions should consider a large portfolio of measures to provide opportunities for all Vermonters to participate. And here, Senator McDonald is one of the surprises. Um, it is possible to put a quantification on where you get the most bang for the buck. And here are four of them. However, um, there's a more recent report or calculation in the Department of Public Services <coughs> um, energy report that just came out this week. And Tom can describe what they found. Right. Well, well. I want to manage expectations here. I haven't <laughs> read the, the report mm -hmm. in, in detail yet. Uh, this came out um, Wednesday afternoon, you know, at about the same time that we were working on getting our report out. Um, but on, on page 18, figure 6 of their annual energy report, they have um, you know, kind of a cost of carbon for different measures. Um, and it, I, it's a very compelling chart. and. I would encourage you to um, get someone from the department in here to discuss the meeting and, and their findings. Uh, the McKinsey chart? It, it's similar, right. Um, and I think as, as you're considering um, the committee bill next year, you know, the central question is what are you trying to achieve with that bill? We've been talking, or I've been listening this week, um, about modernizing the efficiency utility um, programs uh, and services. And so the, the central question is, is why, you know, what do you hope to achieve? And, and I think this chart and this analysis um, should be considered in that discussion. Um, it shows that electric efficiency is the most cost-effective use of dollars from a carbon standpoint. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? What, what I understand this chart to be saying, and again, I want to caveat this, but I haven't read their study in detail, but how I understand it on its face is that the most bang for your buck is funding electric efficiency. Mm -hmm. As we have been doing. Right. And so I, I really think that this this is part of the discussion that needs to be had. It goes on to, it, it looks at, a, a, you know, a whole basket of things that you could put your money towards. Uh, electric efficiency, um, plug-in hybrid vehicles, heat pump water heaters, all electric vehicles, uh, tier two renewable resources. Uh, so again, it, and it has them kind of ranked in a hierarchy in terms of most bang for your buck to, to most costly. And the list that you just gave are that represent that ranking. So after the electric efficiency, investment comes hybrid electric vehicles and then and you say the next right and then heat pump water heaters and then followed by all the, all electric vehicles mm -hmm. and the, and the uh the vein we're looking for on that chart is greenhouse gas reduction that's how i understand yeah. the, the per chart. dollar invested per dollar invested so it's sort of a carbon reduction efficiency yeah, yeah. okay Jenny down only when the electricity is not produced from carbon. I suspect that they have, have incorporated what is Vermont doing in its electric portfolio. So I'm, I'm in agreement. So, so yeah. you're, you're, I think you're saying that the recommendation is if you want to reduce carbon, don't power things with carbon. And that in today's world, electricity has less carbon in it. Therefore, you're recommending electricity. And if electricity were made with coal, you wouldn't be sitting here today recommending. Is that fair analysis? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for pointing that out in the report, and we'll hear from the department next week. Thank you. Again, we'll be uh, doing the heavy lift for the next report, and it will include recommendations. But there are some principles that we're going to be relying on. Um, I've stressed funding a number of times. Funding is essential if we're going to transform the sectors that emit the most greenhouse gases and also 
by the way, also represent Vermonters' biggest energy burden. It, the funding must be consistent and equitable, and any programs that are funded need to be coordinated statewide. The needs of low-income Vermonters must be considered. And finally, as you know, there is a long-standing principle that electric and natural gas ratepayers should not subsidize programs for unregulated fuels, which currently pay no efficiency charge. If current efficiency charge funds were redirected, the bill savings and other benefits that were assumed when the amount of the charge was established would be tenuous at best and could be lost. Vermonters would experience the same rate effect, but would not necessarily experience the benefits. And of course, that said, presumably the programs to which funds were redirected would provide societal benefits and possibly some ratepayer benefits. Our, the current statute, the Commission's current regulatory process for setting efficiency utility budgets and saving goals and avoided costs we're not designed for conducting the cost-benefit analysis of using uh, energy efficiency charge funds for non-electric efficiency. And in our next report, we will examine issues like this. Um, well, and as you know, um, we're contemplating how we might, uh, while waiting for the full reports, um, begin to make progress on those two sectors that are such large sources of emissions. Um, so there's, uh, and in part because we have expertise and staff and funds, uh, with funding um, as opposed to creating new adequate funding for precisely the uh, full work that we're talking about uh, last year. Uh, the challenge is, is the, trying to find a way to get started without um, weakening our energy efficiency. I think that's the, so one of the things we're talking about is a sunset on any provision that we do, and that it would, um, and the, one of the balances is for utilities, EEUs and EUs participating, <coughs> that they're looking for. <clears throat> excuse me, predictability, stability, something that they could actually staff, aim, uh, become expert in and start doing the work. Um, but at the mean, at the meanwhile, we don't want to um, create any kind of program that would allow anyone to feel comfortable with, uh, for the long haul, using energy efficiency charge dollars derived from electric in non on, on the unregulated fuel sector. So there's a Balancing act of the yeah. We're very aware of that too. <laughs> and, and I think the final slide speaks for itself. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to outline what we presented to the, um, in our report this month. You, you read, a, read from your report about what you <coughs> recommend. You read from your report your recommendation on how we should move forward, which was to. Um, could you put that into common language and how it might be reported on by on the radio or on television or underneath people's windshield wipers at shopping centers? Could, what did you recommend that we do that we're not doing differently? We have, in this preliminary report, laid out the landscape, um, the very spotty different programs. Um, we needed to understand that before we could um, bring all those disparate elements together to recommend a statewide program and a statewide approach. Uh, we don't have a specific, as I said in the slide, about what is not in this report. Um, it is not the answer to those um, really um, needy questions, whether to create an all fuels efficiency program or whether to expand the programs that are currently offered by the existing ones. So we don't have, um, this is what we recommend. We're saying this is where we are now, these are some of the considerations, and if we're going to achieve our greenhouse gas reduction goals, we need to target the transportation and weatherization sectors with a lot of um, appropriate funding. 
and your recommendation about appropriate funding is? We, that's coming in our next report. Do, Could you agree with that, Tom? I, I would say more right. to begin with. More. More funding. Um, Rap said yesterday, don't take the current pie and cut it up no, differently. It said, oh, absolutely. The pie should be bigger. Yes. So you're waiting to. We're waiting to see. What, first, we need to analyze how much money is actually needed, and then um, we need to present a recommendation on where those funds should be acquired. We do not believe it should come from the electric efficiency budget. What does that leave as a possible list of choices? That's what's coming in the next report. No, no, no. What, the possible list of choices. Someone should be able to know and articulate today. You may recommend which of those are selected. I mentioned a couple that have been floated. For example, a fuel excise tax. Um, there could be a Put that into the common language. Tax on fuels. Fuel excise tax. I've that never seen a leaflet yeah. under my <clears throat> windshield yeah. that says the legislature is considering a fuel excise tax. I never see the the um This the, is what the, I would the, say. The, the, I've never Fuel seen a leaflet underneath my windshield for anything the legislature has done. So we need more money, number one. Number two, they, they need, we don't know yet where it should come from. We need to do that work. Number two, we need to target the transportation and, and leading guess. sectors if we're going to Maybe reduce our greenhouse gases. Do we, does that include shifting the entire paradigm so that instead of having efficiency be the goal, which is currently the goal of our um, standing efficiency programs and make the goal greenhouse gas reductions, that's a fundamental shift. Presumably that could also mean that we don't, uh, that we raid the, if you want to put it that way, raid the electric efficiency fund to do that. We, uh, we did that for 18 months to, right. to give, to, to provide the opportunity to deal with the things in your first slides about training a workforce, um, you know, X, Y, and Z, where the money is going today to pay for the study that we're getting today that apparently still doesn't suggest where the money should come from, but we have to find a place. We, we've taken from the electric for 18 months. We stole it fair and square to it. But in the future, it needs a funding source. And you're saying we need a funding source that has to be bigger than it is today. Um, we shouldn't take it from the electric efficiency. And the list of choices is income tax, surcharge on well, the wealthy, you need um, to give you an answer. property tax. Not what is the it? analysis for yet? And that's what we've been. That's why I believe your committee gave us till January of 2021 because that requires um, more than we had six months time for. Part of that analysis will be if there is no more money. I mean, because you have to consider all possibilities. If there is no more money, except it's currently raised by the electric efficiency charge, and that if may depend on political will to um, raise a tax or whatever it takes. That's our problem. I know, but let me finish. Um, if there's, this is what we need, this is where it might come from. If, if it were to come from these different sources, what would be the effect on Vermonters, including what would be the effect uh, um, on the, you know, in terms of the successes that we no longer achieve if the money came from the electric efficiency fund. Currently, the electric efficiency work is reducing greenhouse gases, it's saving the water's money, and it is the investment, it is the dollar that brings the most return. Um, you know, every dollar invested in efficiency saves um, the most, um, in lots of different things, um, you know, the, put it just greenhouse gases. Um, anyway, th that's a complex analysis, and we will be delving into all those considerations. So we, so, so sure. McDonald, I, I, just to I, I'm point, gonna, we asked them for recommendations for next year, so to uh, press them for an answer now doesn't seem quite fair. We, we, they have another year to do the work that we asked them to. You have your own hypotheses. You're free to state them at okay. any time. I'm, I mean, if it's going to take political will to raise the money and do this, 
we're the ones, and we're basically, if we can't get any stronger answers today, we, we uh, no longer have to worry about <coughs> political will, and we can wait until next year until we see a report to worry about we that. Hope to and you're going to present what you're going to present it. We hire these people to do what we ask them to do, and when they produce what we ask them to do, that's fine. But to say that we shouldn't, you know, ask them opinions is unfair. It's, we're not into fair. I'm sorry, you hire who? You are, we're saying to you, give us a report. Okay, so what the so, report will There's nothing fair or unfair about that. Yeah. No, it's not fairness. It's just what we are, um, what we are able to present to you yeah. today. Okay. And I'm, what we will hope to present yeah. to you in the next report is options um, analyses so that you can make the decision whether it involves political will or not, it will ultimately be up to you to consider what we present to you in our next report. So if we were to do anything in the interim that, that because fuel changes, fuel use changes all the time, if we were to do something in the interim before we get to the next report, would you caution us to not do anything that would um, preempt or um, overreach or um, and render your future report uh, less useful? Well, the way, the way I see it is we, we didn't say this is, this is your best recommendation for funding. That's clear. We did say here are some very strong principles that you should consider as you're looking at different funding options. And we say six years ago, seven years ago, the Thermal Efficiency Task Force did a very comprehensive, analytical job looking at this. Uh, there are a lot of stakeholders engaged in that process. Uh, they made funding recommendations there. They, they looked at, they recommended many different funding options. Uh, they provided, you know, here are our highest priority, here's a, you know, so-so considerations, and here's, we just can, get enough people on board, so we don't recommend these. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean when you say you didn't get enough people on board? What I mean is, uh, and I'm paraphrasing the task force report here, uh, they're saying these, here was an idea for funding thermal efficiency that was raised, but not too many members of the task force uh, thought that was a viable option, and therefore the task force report didn't recommend it. And recommend so, funding? Sources, is that what you're saying? Did not include it in its highest order recommendations to lawmakers at the time. To do what? To fund? To, to fund thermal well, Why didn't you just say that? Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and so I think what, what the commission's report says is there are a lot of good ideas there. You should consider those today. And at the same time, we've got a lot of work to do, and we will continue to look at those ideas to, to see if we can provide you with any updated recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Our, question, our questions amongst ourselves will be, in the meantime, what, what we do to advance this goal. Thank you. Thank and you. I might add that the Thermal Efficiency Task Force um, targeted or focused on weatherization, which is um, a big part of the problem, and I will um, turn you again to consider some of the recommendations we made in the electric vehicle report in June of last year because there are some common sense ideas as, um, that that would help jumpstart that area. <coughs> jumpstart electric vehicles? Although they don't really need jumpstarts. <laughs> um, so we have those reports in the room. I'll just make sure everyone has access to them and we can um, get a resurrect a copy of the Thermal Efficiency Task Force uh, report, so that we could remind you. And remembering that that um, is a little out of date because right. it includes natural gas. Right. Okay. Um, I have a, um, your principles informing future recommendations. The second bullet is any new funding should be consistent and equitable. Um, and I'm, can you elaborate a little bit on that word equitable? Because uh, we've talked about different perspectives. And, uh, for instance, an individual ratepayer might have a different perspective than ratepayers as a group, and or one, members of one utility versus members served by another utility, or even uh, society at large looking at some sort of societal test. So how do you, when you say equitable, what, 
how are you thinking about that? Right, I, I think, Senator, you have put your finger on it that equitable can mean different things. Um, and I think at the highest order, when I hear this word, I go back to traditional regulatory rate-making principles of cost, cause, or pays. Uh, it, in my opinion, uh, absent some other very compelling policy reason, uh, one class of customers should not be subsidizing a different class of customers. So, so when we're when we implement our current efficiency programs, we have a number of different equity standards that we hold efficiency of Vermont, Burlington Electric, Vermont Gas to. We know that the residential class of customers contributes a certain amount to the funds, commercial and industrial contribute a different amount. We want the outcomes to be, you know, to kind of not exactly reflect each customer class's contribution, but there ought to, you know, be pretty close outcomes. Same thing with geographic equity. I know that this committee heard from other witnesses over the past couple of days talking about geographic equity. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, it's done on a county basis. Um, we know that the VEPSA members ha have been discussing, um, rather than or in addition to doing it on a county-wide basis, let's look at this on a utility-by-utility -utility basis. Another idea might be um, let's consider low-income customers and, and make sure that you know we're returning at least as many benefits to those customers as they contribute to the fund. And those are the types of things that, that I believe the Commission was referring to uh, when it used this word. Which one? Okay. Equitable. Um, it was such a long ramble. What do you mean you said consistent? Well, can I stick with one question here? So equitable, um, when we do something like low in income sensitivity provisions. So that seems as though we're, we're adding another criteria in, in, and perhaps shifting benefits. So it's, it's I'm, equitable, it sounds like um, you want me aim for it, be conscious of it, but it's, there could be inequities as in um, greater benefits delivered to the lower income Vermonters than non-low income Vermonters that the social policy sort of laid on to the equity discussion? Is that my on the right track here? That's how I look at it, is um, here, here's what the traditional principles, here's how that would guide us. Uh, there may be other compelling policy reasons, yeah. um, so, societal reasons why we may go uh, beyond what would you know, traditional regulatory rate making approach would guide you. Uh, Senator King, uh, uh, McDonald, you had a question about consistency? No, I did. Uh, what a period after consistency, because that's a principle that everybody understands, and we've all talked over and over again that poor and disadvantaged Vermonters shouldn't be put farther behind when we implement the program. That's one of the principles that you're trying to say when you use the word equitable. Is that what you're trying to say? It includes uh, the notion of not cost, not, uh, again, as Mr. Nauer said, um, the cost causer um, pays. So another way of thinking about that is um, cost shift. People um, and people benefiting from what they're paying as well. So those are all forms of being equitable. So poor and disadvantaged Vermonters today, regardless of what we do, one of the principles is when we do it, it shouldn't leave them farther behind and finding life less affordable than they do before we make the change. That's one of the principles? That's another principle, yes. We think that low-income considerations um, are important as in this next slide here. We need to be sensitive to the needs of low-income Vermonters. Thank you. Um, any committee questions for the commission? Right. So um, our plan as a committee is to put together a committee bill and we'll um, share that with you all so this when we have it and invite you and all the other
and all the stakeholders that you've seen uh, in Act 62 to weigh in on the draft we produce. But I think the direction I believe we're going based on this week's discussion is to do something quite narrow, and both in terms of <coughs> new permissions to use some uh, funding in the transportation sector, fully recognizing that every fuel should pull its own weight, and that would, but we're not ready for that complete discussion. Um, and that to build in some uh, limitations, to be conscious of limitations on it, so that we keep an eye on the equitable piece that we're just talking about. So, Great. Um, if there are not any more questions, then uh, thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you, and we look forward to the next time. We'll book this for uh, <coughs> January 17th, 2021. And we're ready, ready to go. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. And for anyone in the room, uh, this the PUC's report is up on uh, the home page of the committee page. We'll get onto that page as well, the department's uh, report. And we'll be hearing from the department next, we'll be scheduling with the department next week to come in and spend time with us in more detail. So we'll get to go through that uh, with you. And um, uh, so for the moment, I just want to pause and see if, based on that report, if there's, uh, I mean, everyone, almost everyone in the room participated in the hearing in the last two days. I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions they want to share now before we wrap up in here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, in that case, thank you all. Keep an eye on us next week. We'll be inviting you all back in uh, as we start to shape up the bill, and we are adjourned for the day.